Okay, hey. uh, this is lecture two, and I had a nice uh, walk yesterday. I used to live in Boulder and enjoy the afternoon uh, uh, doing the hiking here. It's really great. Um, I'm going to start here um, with a little cultural uh, statement about how to do physics. Uh, and this is very private to you, very special. It's a little bit conjecture. So it's not, and I, w I would like the professor types to go check their email now. And, and so I will disavow if anything leaks out of here. But I want to say something about charge noise. And how many people know about the charge noise problem? Okay, a couple, good. Yeah, that's, that's what makes me good. And of course, superconducting qubits. But I'm going to say there's a charge noise problem with every, like every, almost every qubit that I know of, okay, it's a big problem in the field, and it's limiting, I mean, we can do things, but it's kind of limiting the full scope of what we can do, okay? And I'll give you an example. You make spin qubits, and you encode the information in the spin, and I call this kind of a neutrinoized encoding. It's very hard to interact if you do things right with the rest of the environment. It's a really good qubit, long T1, that's great. But to interact the spins, the and natural spin-spin interaction is not very big, so you tend to do, uh, a, you, you convert kind of a spin to charge conversion, and you do some kind of charge interaction to, you know, enhance and make that interaction fast. Well, what happens as soon as you enter charge into the picture? You can see charge noise. And if you look at the fidelity of the two qubit gates in like a char in a charge qubit spin qubit, that it's not that good, okay? And it's a real limitation, and people are working on it. If you look at ion traps, there's something called fluctuating patch potentials that cause some noise in the system that makes it hard and, and gives you decoherence when you're kind of interacting two qubits in an ion trap. Okay, and people have been working on it and try to understand. Then they're getting better at that. That's kind of like a charge noise because you have some E fields from that. And, uh, you know, topological qubits, at, at some point they're going to do a charge measurement. You're going to have a problem there. Okay. Now let me tell you the cultural aspect of this. Is that I see, it for me, well, what do we do in superconductors? We just made sure we weren't sensitive to charge. Okay? So we got rid of the problem. These other qubits can't do that. Now, one of the things that I have found very odd in my career is that although charge noise has been known to be a problem for, I don't know, 10, 15 years or so, it's not talked about too much. Okay, there were some hands raised. I was really happy with that. Maybe they talked about it for the Josephson junctions, but, you know, it's uh, true for everything. And it's kind of funny to me that you don't char talk the scientists like me, who are senior in charge of things, when we don't talk about a big problem, okay? Now, you should realize there's a reason for this, okay? And I was told by a fairly famous person on some other issue, is you don't talk about your problems because it might depress people, okay? And maybe they won't work in your field, okay? And I'll tell you from experience, the most depressing thing that happens to you is you're working hard on your technology and your competitors figure out something really great and they pass you and it's like everything you do is irrelevant now. That's the most depressing thing, okay? If you want to minimize that chance, my personal ethos and advice is that you have to talk about your problems. And if you talk about your problems, not all the time, but you talk about your problems, then your group, knows they have to solve it, other people know you have to solve it. And in the case of superconducting qubits, in about, I don't know, 2004, 2005, when we were just getting things to work, I and other people talked about our problems, and the funding agent said, okay, here's some money, you, know, you guys work on coherence. And we did for five years, and the whole group solved a bunch of problems in a bunch of different ways all around the world. We solved that. And now, you know, we're kind of in a preeminent position because we solved our problems because we talked about it, okay? So it's just, you know, I, it, it's hard. You have to balance getting your funding with solving your problems. I know that's hard. But, uh, you know, we have to talk about the problems, okay? And 
So, okay, so that's, that's the end of the, you can, you can listen to me now. I know you weren't listening. <laughs> okay. Question? Yeah, great. Sorry, sorry, I wasn't listening, but I was wondering, what problems don't superconducting circuits people talk about now? Uh, TLS. Two-level system. Two system. I'll talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. If they talk about it a little bit, what happened? Oh, this is really interesting. For a long time, people have kind of got mad because we talk about it. Oh, it's ugly and whatever. And we've been doing research on it. And we've been taking data and whatever. And then what happened at the March meeting is people started talking about it again and were wondering. So we actually wrote a paper and put it out and it's under referee and everyone's happy about it because people are kind of ready to talk about it now. Uh, we said kind of bank the data a little bit, but it's kind of funny. But you know, it's great. I mean, we're happy when people want to talk about it because there's a lot of ideas out there. It's not just us we're going to solve the problem. So that's really cool. Yes? Yeah, isn't the, so there's been some discussion about the topological qubits. Yeah. Is, the, isn't the idea or motivation for topological qubits precisely to yeah. in this exotic? Yeah, yeah. You can hide, you can hide the, the charge, but at some point you have to measure it and then the charge noise is going to come, you know, you're going to see it. Yeah, you might see it, because then the dephasing doesn't matter. So I, I don't know if it's going to be a problem or not. Mostly it's just, you know, you have to talk about it, okay? And you, you can't just sweep it under the rug, you know, especially experimentalists that, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of this dirt physics that, you know, if, if, we, if we didn't have charge noise, and we didn't have charge noise in all these physical systems, the quantum computer would be way, way easier to make, okay? So it's kind of interesting. There'll be a lot more uh, capabilities there. And the basic problem is, is if you, you, you hook up your, your device and you measure how much charge, your charge is just sitting there and the charge on your thing is fluctuating by about 10 to minus 3 of electron, okay? Roughly. It, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes less. And then that, that if, if you're sensitive to charge, then your frequency is fluctuating maybe by 10 to minus 3 or so, roughly. And then you're going to dephase and uh, lose your coherence pretty fast. You know, uh, let's say 10 nanoseconds, 100 nanoseconds, it's not good. Okay, so that's, that's the issue. Okay, now in superconducting qubits, you can, uh, also uh, in, in superconducting qubits, if you have a quasi-particle, excitation of a superconductor, not supposed to be there, but of course they're there, if it tunnels through, that's a charge, uh, charge change by one electron, which is a huge amount. And then you can see that, okay? So quasi-particle tunneling, defect motion, we produce charge noise, it's not negligible. The way you model that, okay, uh, in a circuit, you have this charge noise, okay, which can write, uh, divide by 2e to get a gate, a gate change, charge noise. And you model that with just an offset to the quadratic charging term, okay? Pretty simple here. And then as if this is fluctuating, this changes up and down a little bit, then what happens to the, the energy of the, of, the, of the state, okay? Now, um, what, we, uh, uh, what we did yesterday is we talked a little bit about what happens because there, there's these two parameters, inductor and capacitor of a resonator. You can talk about the resonant frequency, but also the impedance. Is a, is a good thing to talk about. And we said that this impedance, when this impedance of the resonator is very high, then you're in a charge basis where the zero point fluctuation of the charge is much less than 2e, okay? Or you can talk about where z0 is much smaller than the resistance quantum, you're down here, you're in a flux or phase basis where that's good. And the reason I like to talk about impedance Okay, you, th this, this ratio here, Z0 or RK, I talk about impedance. Alternatively, you can talk about EC over EJ, okay, from the Hamiltonian. Okay, these are parameters, you can do that. However, this to me is much more physically, it's just the square root. Uh, this is more, uh, this, this tells me more about nature. Okay, and for example, one of the things I would say is when people first discovered the Josephson effect, they were building junctions and systems with the impedance 
that's of around 50 ohms, a low impedance system. Okay, that's what you naturally do when you start out. And that's why all the physics of the Josephson effect was worked out in the flux basis. And why you have the Josephson equations and uh, the voltage standard and all that, because this is naturally what you have is that most circuits you build are low impedance around lower than the free space impedance okay and nowhere near or nowhere above the quantum resistance of 25 kilo ohms and then of course the last 20 30 years or so people made devices in a special way to get in this region to see the charge basis okay so uh, we're, we're naturally going to be down here and of course like i said here you're out here in the charge basis and your charge wiggles a little bit and you know generally it's going to cause a wiggling of your frequency of the qubit and dephasing and problems so you want to be here now note that this z0 over rk again goes as ec over ej squared so as you go down in this direction the, the charging energy energy gets lower and lower and if you go back from the slide last time, the nonlinearity of the system, that's the difference of this energy to this energy, that goes as EC. And remember, we need nonlinearity to make a qubit. And you kind of want to make it as large as possible so that you, know, you, can, you can make fast transitions here. And I'll get to, get to that later, the, the, the physics of that. So down here is really bad because you're nonlinear. So you tend to push yourself in this direction to get bigger nonlinearity, but we don't want to be sensitive to charge. So how do you optimize that? And that's what this calculation is about. We need to know the sensitivity to charge even while we're into the, uh, the basis. And of course, this was worked out by the Yale group when they invented the transmon. I, and they have it done very nicely. I'm going to give you the simple experimentalist view of how to think about this. Okay? Now, John? yes? So when you talk about charges, you're talking about, like in terms of that Hamiltonian, you're talking about classical fluctuations of energy? That's right. Not, you know, and, and it's the quantum. Yeah, and, and what happens is you have charge defects around the device, and they move a little bit in time, at, even at low temperatures. And that induces a little bit more charge into the device. Should I think of it as just classical? Class, it's just classical uh, uh, fluctuating charge bias. Classical noise. I mean, at, at some point, you can, you can wiggle this fast, and a control signal and other things will happen. But right now, I'm just worried about the, the change in, in bias, change in frequency, low frequency. So I, I'm sorry, I'm hard to hear. Uh, yeah, the, the charging noise has a temperature, the charge noise can have some temperature dependence and all these complicated things. Uh, again, it's around, you know, 10 to minus 3 for typical low temperature things and, you know, it's big enough to worry about it. There's a whole physics of the charge noise I won't go into, mostly because we can ignore it. Okay, that's a whole other topic. Okay, how do you deal, so we're in, the, we're in the phase basis, but how do we deal with this charge noise term here? And you know from basic quantum mechanics that in the, ba the phase basis, a charge offset can be described as a displacement operator, e to the i, whatever this displacement is, times the conjugate variable. Okay, so it's a displacement operator. And uh, what you can do in, in thinking about this particular system for the transmon, you have a wave function that is periodic between minus pi and pi. So remember I said this could be mapped into a, um, into a pendulum. And of course the pendulum looking this side uh, is the same wave function here if you're looking at the other side. So these two wave functions match up, but there's a boundary condition that's not that, uh, but there's a, there's a phase difference between the wave function from here to here due to the displacement operator by e to the i n g times 2 pi. Okay, so that's how you set up the problem, is you solve this the, 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 for the wave functions with the fact that there's a, a, per, a periodic boundary condition. Now, the physics is that if you have some harmonic oscillator kind of state, it's going to be close to it, this is going to go down exponentially here, so that the effect of this boundary condition, if this is exponentially small, is going to have an exponentially small dependence on the gate. So that's why when you're in this phase basis, 
and you know you have an exponentially small tail here that's why you expect to see no exponentially small uh, charge dependence over here okay so that's good I mean it's going to be a small effect and we want to know what's going on so well how do you uh, how do you calculate that now you can uh, uh, I think you 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 solve a certain set of equations there's a numerical uh, exact solution for this but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say uh, and I, I, it's, an, it's a guess and it turns out to be correct so that's why I, I'm guessing it of course and I'm going to say the energy which is a function of this is sub n sub g okay that's a typo is proportional to the wave function squared the probability of the wave function there where you're going to do this boundary condition so if the probability goes down exponentially, then this will have an exponentially small uh, dependence. And the nice thing about that is you can then just plug in the harmonic oscillation ground state wave function and say, well, what is the wave function at pi? And when you do that, you get uh, plugging in the, the, the from formula, as I showed you before, and what you know, it's just RK over 8Z0. Uh, eight, eight Z, Z so as z0 gets uh, to very small here, then that ratio gets very big and uh, it's small. You can also write this equivalently using the ej over ec ratio, which I showed over there. Okay, now that's an approximate, that's a harmonic oscillator. What you can do is you can compute this using WKB, okay, because it's a uh, this is not exactly a harmonic oscillator, but you can plug in this potential. It's an integral you can do. And in that case, you get this formula here, which you see is exactly what you found with the harmonic oscillator, but it's some number uh, close to one, okay, that gives you. And this is the exact result, it is if you do the mathematics properly, okay? So, you, you just have to make this ratio small. So, so the exponential dependence, we choose, yes? What is that? Uh, this is for, okay, there's no, okay, so this is not, a, there's not an NG because I haven't put in this boundary condition. I've just said that. So it's, it's a rough magnitude. Let's say it's a maximum. It's a roughly the maximum. This should not be uh, NG, in fact. Okay, so this, this uh, change in energy due to cu coupling together has a magnitude of this. So it's not the full formula just says the magnitude. I'm just trying to get the physics here. But it's an estimate for the width of the levels? Yeah, yeah, between those two levels. Right. Again, it's, it comes from matching of the wave function from here to here. Right. And it, you, it, this, is, this is the correct formula. I just want to show you where it comes from. Okay, you can do all the mathematics yourself. And, you know, this is an exponential, so you just make this exponentially small, and I don't care what the functional dependence is. So what you do is a good choice is to have this coupling energy of about 200 megahertz for uh, about a 6 gigahertz oscillation. And then uh, this EJ over EC ratio is 80. And then when you work out the math, this is E to the minus 25. So the change in energy is exponentially small, super small, okay? So that's how you get rid of it. Now, what people, a lot of people do is they choose a larger 400 megahertz EC, E to the minus 12, that's still super small, it's okay. We're trying to make sure that they're really far in the limit where we don't have to worry about this at all. But there, there's some small changes to different people's design. There's a lot of system optimization going on. But you know, you just take it, you, you're taking advantage of the exponential. So this is good. This, this is just going up as EC, but the charge uh, uh, sensitivity is leaking out here exponentially small. So you can, you can make that uh, optimization properly. Okay? Good. I just want to say, if you want to compute, actually compute what's going on in this whole range, Okay, this is not very hard to do is to numerically uh, solve uh, that, that problem. Uh, in fact, I, it's probably easier than figuring out all the mathematics before it. And just to remind people of how to do this, uh, uh, you just made a matrix of a, of a bunch of different positions in delta. 
across here, maybe a thousand positions or so. And you get uh, cosine uh, potential. You put that on the diagonal because that's your basis. Uh, the Q operator uh, is then uh, a difference between uh, what the wave function is uh, at one position higher than you and one position uh, less than you. So, so uh, Q is, uh, 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 this is, is d, d delta. Okay, uh, so the finite difference is this, and Q squared is the second derivative and gives you a matrix like this. So you just put together a thousand by thousand matrix, which represents the Hamiltonian, and diagonalize it, and then you can get the wave functions and the energies and the wave functions given here. So these are typical uh, values here, uh, where uh, here I put the end gate of 0.1, and you see the, this is psi squared, uh, and you see the, the, uh, the bound flux states that look like a harmonic oscillator. And then once that energy goes over the top of the potential, so that's where, uh, you know, classically you're, you're up, up here in the energy, you then have running states, uh, which are described by here, these uh, continuous uh, or almost constant values versus phase, this is uh, more localized and charge, and now you see a difference between the two, uh, two gates. So in the charge limit, if you look at a very highly excited state, you do see some charge sensitivity, but we generally don't go up there, and that's fine. Yes? Uh, do you typically have a set number of bound states or finite or...? Um, you have a finite number of bound states, typically about eight or so, right? And, you know, you want to if you were to excite your qubit too much, you could get into a problem. And we people have done experiments where you look at a couple of these states, so you have to worry about that, because these, these excited states will have more charge noise. It's one of the reasons why we're a little bit conservative in our charge noise, because these guys are going to have some dependence. There was another question here. Here. So just to clarify, if you uh, draw the same diagram with respect to Yes. Um, yeah, these would be flat. That's right. Yeah. 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 So you could you could you could solve this in the charge basis too, and then these guys these uh, the Josephson potential turns into tunneling terms. The the cosine terms is e the i. Uh, I phase, E to the minus I phase, those represent tunneling terms, and then you can solve it that way. So that's the pe way that people solve on a charge basis. I'm not solving that because we're, we're not doing that. We're not in that basis. But you can solve the problem exactly, you know, this way. Easy. Easy way. Okay. Okay. So we're in this parameter range. We're not worried about this DC charge noise problem. Uh, everything's great. So um, we're going to do a microwave drive. I'm just going to talk about how that works. We talked about that before. Uh, voltage bias from the leads, capacitive coupling. It looks like a charge. This is now we're going to consider this at microwave frequencies to drive a transition to the qubit. And I'm going to write down the Hamiltonian, pull it out of thin air. I mean, you guys know how to derive it, but uh, you know, after doing this a while, you know how to construct these. And basically, we have a classical Q bias, okay? It says a large voltage source, a small capacitance, so that it, it looks cl like a classical drive, a weak, a weak uh, drive, classically. So this is not added. And then V is the, the voltage, the quantum mechanical voltage across the device. So that's what the Hamiltonian is going to look like. And then uh, uh, I can write that as Q bias Q hat over C, okay, where Q hat is the uh, uh, canonical uh, variable in the system. And you look at Q hat, and that's Q zero point. We have a, uh, the V bias and, and Q bias gives you a capacitance and V bias. There's a CC over C here. And then with the uh, zero point, you have an A minus A dagger, okay? Simple algebra. And we're, uh, we're going to assume, like, all the matrix elements and everything is the same as a harmonic oscillator because it's pretty close to a harmonic oscillator state. And 
uh, the fact that, you know, we don't really know what that number is to 10, 20, maybe 10, 20 percent. So any small change in the matrix element is going to be swamped by the uncertainty of that, we, uh, what we know there. And that's an A minus A dagger in a harmonic oscillator limit. We're going to truncate that to a qubit. And A minus A dagger uh, in uh, poly operators is sigma y. Okay? So that's the way we, we think about, uh, uh, you know, writing this in a quantum language. So in terms of a block sphere, a sigma y operator uh, rotates the, the state uh, around this axis. So if we start in the zero state and turn on a microwave drive for a certain amount of time, it starts rotating around and then it'll go to one state and then go to the zero state. So this is the experimental data. This is experimental data now. We start in the ground state, we put on microwaves on resonance for a variable amount of time. At the end we measurement, I'll talk about how to do that. We start with the probability of zero, zero equal one. And then at, what is this, uh, 50, this is about 20, about 10 nanosecond pulse, we get 50% zero and 50% one, that's on the equator. At 20 nanoseconds, we're in the one state. And then at uh, 40 nanoseconds, we go, we rotate around. So this is the typical Rabi oscillation. Okay, yes? Just to clarify, this BB is an oscillating flow, and then, and then you think about the yes. Hamiltonian, you yes. really are in the rotating flow. That's right. Yeah. So this, uh, this is, this is a, a classical dry field, which we convert with this, is actually giving you a classical charge drive. And then uh, that interacts, uh, charge and voltage interact to give you an energy, which the, I write as a Q. And then from Q, you can write down from uh, the harmonic oscillator, you know, what the operators are. That's, a, yeah, that's, how, you, that's how you think about it. OK? And then you see it oscillates nicely. OK. Uh, and, and we talked about this a little bit before in, in general in theory, but that's the way we do single qubit gates. Okay. Now, <coughs> we can talk about measuring the energy decay time uh, by putting it into the, doing a zero to one flip and then waiting a time and see how, how long it stays in the one state. You can do Ramsey uh, things. You can do a lot of experiments to understand that. What we really want to know, though, is we're going to build a quantum computer. We're going to do a series of gate operations in order to run a, a algorithm. Hundreds or thousands or ten to the, eventually 10 to the 9 gate operations. And we want to know if we sequentially do a lot of different gate operations, are we getting what we want to get? OK? So, uh, uh, it, it's, it's nice at this point, instead of spending too much time looking at the various metrics of a single qubit, to know what happens when you want to put on a complex control sequence. And does it work properly? Because there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you put in lots of different control sequences. And you want to check that it's OK. And what we're going to do to do this is, is test this. It's something called randomized benchmarking. And the thing is, it's a realistic test of a, a multi-qubit and, uh, uh, and single-qubit test of a long algorithm doing lots of pulses. And does it work properly? Okay. Uh, where maybe in the end, you're going to have hundreds or maybe a thousand gates. Do you get the right answer? Okay. So this is a uh, uh, step back and understand how we're going to do that. The basic idea here is we're going to put in a bunch of gates. OK? And you can see, uh, see this here. Uh, these, are, these are all microwave pulses uh, that are going into the device. And we're putting in a bunch of different gates. And then we're going to measure the state of the system at the end and say, well, was the block vector, vector in the direction we, we thought it should be? OK? So that's the basic idea. Now, it's done in a little bit more clever way because uh, there's, there's something funny that we're trying to do here. Um, when you measure these gates, 
um, you can get an error. And the error is described with some quantum process tomography with a complicated uh, full matrix of what's going on with the amplitude and phases and the errors and looking at that in a very complicated way. What you really kind of want to know, though, is that's very complicated. And when you have all these different uh, errors that can add up over time, as you do something, it's very complicated. What we prefer would like to know, and it's an approximation, but we would like to know, is can we describe those errors in a probabilistic manner and say that there's certain probability for the first error and a certain probability for the second error, and we just add up the probabilities to the end and see if that number makes sense. Okay. Now, it, it, this is a little bit dangerous because there could be coherences, you know, in, uh, you, you know, in, in these errors that cause this, this kind of simple adding of the probability not to work. It's an approximation. What has happened is we make this approximation and we do measurements assuming this approximation and get numbers. And then we run more realistic algorithms. And this kind of probabilistic uh, approximation to what the net error rate actually works pretty good. OK? And that may depend on the system or not. Our, our system, it seems to work well. So we're going to kind of stick with this system of just trying to measure the error probability over time. Again, doing things very carefully so that that doesn't screw up. And then, you know, see how far we can get with, with that. And see if at some point, if the errors are way worse than we estimated, then we know this approximation isn't good. Okay. So this is a, actually a very important thing that's happening in the field. We, we initially did this full quantum tomography. It's nice, but it wasn't telling you that much. We want to do very deep circuits. The simple thing is to forget about the coherences. Just add the errors. Well, actually works pretty well. Okay? So basically, we run a bunch of a sequence of devices, measure the state at the end, and then see if it's what we, we wanted to get. So in fact, the, the C's here are called Clifford's, and they are either 180 degree rotations or 90 degree rotations uh, uh, in the block sphere, so plus some Hadamars, other ones like that. But they form a group. Uh, a, a, a logic group that explores the block sphere, but uh, can be classically calculated very efficiently what will happen. And given they're exploring the whole uh, block sphere, it's nice because you're, you basically randomize any coherences that might be there so that you're going to see, uh, at least theoretically, uh, these probabilities. And then what we do is we measure uh, uh, for various, very different amount of Cliffords, we measured what's the probability to be in the state that we expected in the end. Usually you take the ground state to the ground state. So you take the ground state, you go to the ground state, what's the probability to be in the ground state? And what you see uh, is that as you increase the number of, of uh, gates in here, that that probability goes down exponentially in time, as you expect. If it was just a, a fixed error per gate, and you go out to hundreds and hundreds of gates before it goes down 20, 25 percent, and from this decay curve here, you, in this particular case, you get an error uh, every uh, a, a thousand gate operations or so. So you can quantify that with it. Yes. You, you usually start in the ground state and you end up in the ground state. How do you distinguish if it was just like T1 relaxation? So what happens is you could, you could alternatively start in the one state and measure in the one state to check that. But what happens is as soon as you start doing this, you're putting your safe in, in a, you know, random states. It's a known but you know, kind of randomly chosen state and thus you're averaging over the block sphere. So uh, that's why uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's kind of a, you're averaging in, in that matter. And since, you know, the final, initial and final state are two out of a thousand, that bias doesn't really matter. Yeah? Uh, this is just done with 
I, I, can you speak up? I, I, is this just done with single qubit gates, or do you also do uh, randomized? Yeah, we can do it for two qubit gates, too, and higher. But this is just for randomized, just to get the idea across. Yeah? So I didn't quite understand. So the errors are not correlated with what you're saying, but all, the, all these uh, algorithms are random, right? So you're kind of averaging over random gates. So I wouldn't ex even if there was some correlation, I wouldn't expect. Yeah, so yes, and, that, and that's the point, is you could have um, um, some, uh, some uh, correlated things, but because you're averaging uh, over, you know, a random gate sets, the choice of the random gate sets depolarize, you know, scrambles the randomness, so the net result is not to see coherence. Uh, now, you know, so I'm going to actually come back to this point about, you know, is this kind of a little bit fake of doing the coherence? Because this is actually the smart way to run an algorithm, okay? And because, because you're depolarizing, you're randomizing all the coherences. The choice of the random gates are randomizing the coherences, so by the time you look at a bunch of different gates, a bunch of different instances of gates, you know, there might be a hundred different instances of these chosen gates that all get randomized is all averages to zero and then it doesn't matter. But real algorithms don't have these they don't have it but you put in this in a clever way so you get it and that's the trick. It's not very well known yet that you should compile algorithms that way. So this is actually very realistic to do this and I'll, I'll come back to this. This is a very important point. Okay. Yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Okay, these are just, you know, the random, uh, the, the random Cliffords. Okay, so that, that's what you get. Okay, good. Thanks for the questions. That's really great. Actually, it's helpful for me. And you're, answer, you're asking, right? Yes? So this might be kind of nitpicky, but why don't the green points go all the way down? I mean, I assume you append these back. With appendage. So these green points, I've tried to hide, but I'll show them now. Okay. Now, you want to know, someone asked, you wanted to know what's the error of a Z gate, okay, or some other gate. You want, you know, you want to really understand this well. So what you do is you do an interleaved randomized benchmarkings, which are the green points, where you do what you did last time, but then you interleave with them. In this case, it's an X over 2, but it could be a Z gate, okay? So you interleave that. And then you do another randomly chosen Clifford, and then you do the same gate. And you're just basically measuring this gate over and over again. And, uh, and then, of course, since you're adding gates, the coherence is going to get worse. And then knowing how many gates you have here and how many gates you have here, you can get a, uh, an error due to that particular gate. So that's what the greens are doing. And it's worse. There's more gates. And you can do a Z gate. You can do whatever gate you want. Does that make sense? An X over 2 gate is just a 92 rotation. And an X is 180. That's our jargon. Okay. So this procedure uh, gives the average gate This gets the average gate fidelity. So how useful it is? I'll show you. So um, what, what happens is, what's interesting about the interleave, I'll, uh, let me see if I answer your question this way. What's interesting about the interleave is you can get a gate fidelity for doing nothing, for doing 180 degree rotations, 90 degree rotations in the opposite directions, Hadamard, Z gates, whatever you want to do. Okay, you can, you can do that. And then for the different qubits, I, I tell you what the, uh, the, the fidelities are here. And what you see is there's not a big change as you do the different gates. And some qubits are better and some qubits are worse, but they all of these average out to a number that's pretty close to what happened uh, when we did, uh, when we just did the randomized gates. And what it kind of tells you is that there's not some funny thing going on with the gates and some are better than others. It's, you know, more or less independent of that, so it's mostly coherence effects. And this would be, this would be due to T1 or T2 the de natural decay or dephasing of, of the qubits. And in fact, these errors are consistent 
with you know uh, those kind of estimates that you can make. If there was some of these gates that were way worse, then you would maybe worry that something was going wrong and you'd go and fix it. So you can look into this very carefully and make sure that things are, things are good. If there's no structure there, it just means you're seeing general decoherence and it's fine. Okay? Yes? Excuse me? I'm doing single qubit on the time, and then this is, this is for the different qubits in this device. Right, so the average over qubit is just average for each single qubit, you're not doing like five qubits. No, yeah, yeah. And then, we can, of course, we can average over all these numbers and, you know, yeah, yeah, and show that. Okay. Okay. Yes. Well, we, can, we actually did a, a two T gates. So T gate is non-Clifford. So we just did one and then we did another, which turns it into a Clifford. And, you know, basically you, you know, you get the same result. Okay. But, you know, this is a T gate that has errors in it. But, okay, we know it's bad. So you can check whether things are working right. That is the point. And you can check for any weird thing. So it, it doesn't say that there's not going to be coherences in the problem. Uh, you, you, uh, uh, yeah, so... So at this point, since there's a question about, about this, I'm going to stop and, and have, a, have a discussion um, how this thing works. The big problem with these superconducting qubits is that we have tunable qubits, lines coming in from here, where we can change the frequency of the qubits. And, be, and we do that, which we'll see very shortly, to be able to make better two qubit gates. But because it's a tunable qubit, it means any noise coming down this wire, the DC current could fluctuate a little bit, or there can be flux noise from the materials in here across here. That flux will, will <coughs> okay. I didn't explain something. These are tunable qubits. So if you look at the frequency of the qubit versus the flux, and what happens in our qubits, if remember, we had two qubits and then connected to a capacitor forming the resonator. And then we had a DC line flux coming into here. This flux changes the critical current of these junctions and that changes the inductance, it changes the frequency. And that allows us the, to tune the frequency of the qubit with flux, more or less like this, where this is one half flux quantum in this loop. And we can change the qubit frequency. And I'm going to show why we're going to do that in a minute. Now, if we're going to change the qubit frequencies and we're sitting out here somewhere, that means if we have some spins that are fluctuating and that changes the flux here, we have some noise in this current here, which changes the flux into this loop. Our bias point, which we think is here, is going to wiggle a little bit. And that means this frequency is going to wiggle a little bit. And then you're going to get dephasing. And you're going to get decoherence because the, the phase of the qubit is not going to be known because of noise on this. Okay. So it can be a problem. Uh, what happens is this noise tends to be coming at low frequency. It's 1 over F noise. So there's a lot of noise at low frequency and very little noise at high frequency. And basically what this means, approximately means, that over time, you think, every time you do an experiment with your qubit, you think it's at a certain frequency, but the noise has put it at a slightly different frequency, and next time it's a slightly different frequency, and next time it's a slightly different frequency. Okay? So it tends to do that. So you, the frequency of the qubit is unknown by a small amount. And if you have an unfrequency, a change in frequency, uncertainty in frequency, 
and then you uh, operate that qubit for a certain amount of time, then you're going to get a phase error uh, here and a probability of error which goes as the phase difference squared that goes as the magnitude of that fluctuation t squared. Okay. So this error can grow rapidly and it can be a problem. So how do you deal with this? Okay. There's two very well te known techniques to deal with this. Okay, one of the techniques is doing spin echo. Oh, well, no, Let, let's see. The first technique is to only measure at small times. Okay, don't, uh, you know, uh, have, you have a small time algorithm. Don't, this is, this is going as t squared. Remember, if you have an incoherent error, which I'm talking about here, it goes as t. Okay, this is going to t squared. So you want to have small time gates. The other thing you can do, which is really the solution, is you can do spin echo. Okay, and spin echo is basically you're taking your state in the in the in the uh, in like a zero plus one, and you put a pi pulse on it so that it's zero minus one, and then whatever phase accumulation you get in one part of your sequence gets canceled through the, the spin echo in another part of your thing. So you, you kind of uh, sometimes get positive phase added and sometimes you're going to get negative phase added and then these phases are going to uh, subtract away and go to zero. Okay, I'm not explaining the uh, 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 spin echo. I, I need to put in a slide on that. Do people familiar? I think spin echo is generally well known well enough that maybe that's okay. Do you have any questions on that? So you put in pi pulses into your your system to echo the, to echo it so you negate the, the a extra phase adding and then as long as those echoes are such that they're short enough so that you don't get a big contribution of, of t squared then it's going to be small and you're going to be okay okay so what you do is you just put in spin echoes into your algorithm so you make an algorithm and you put in spin echoes and then this problem goes away so that's a generic way you get rid of low frequency, uh, low frequency noise. Okay. If, you, if the noise is too big, then this, this it's, it's second order correction doesn't work as well. But there's modest amount of noise, you're okay. Okay. So you do yes. I'll talk about that later. Okay. But we've done that, and then you can show it small. But I'll, I'll get to that. So you use spin echo. What happens here when you're using these randomized Cliffords here, randomly chosen Cliffords? Some of them are spin echoes. Some of them are not. But you're essentially moving the state all around the block sphere, and you're effectively doing a spin echo. Maybe not as efficiently as if you put in the exact pi pulse that you would need in the spin echo, but by putting in all these Cliffords, you are randomizing the effect of this coherent phase gain, and then you're okay. So that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, this works very well is putting in random, randomly chosen gates is effectively a spin echo and gets rid of this. Now, when you have a real algorithm, I'm just going to, uh, yeah, okay, here's just a real algorithm, okay, a CNOT gate, okay? What I can do is, uh, uh, you know, so uh, it's not spin echo. What you can do is something called randomized compiling, okay? And you can put in gates here, x, x dagger, maybe a y, y dagger, and same thing here, x, 
uh, you know, why, why dagger, and some other, you know, gates here, okay? And because you're daggering these, it's no difference. What you can then do is take these two gates here, and you know what their application is once you go through the C naught. So you're going to have an X, and you're going to have a Y, and you're going to have your C naught. And then this is going to uh, go through here with some other gate, which I don't, I don't, I'm not going to compute, but you can compute what it's going to be. And then there's going to be a Y and Y dagger here. And then you can take these gates and this gate and combine it together to a new gate, you know, A, a and A prime, which are single qubit gates. And you see what you've done is even though the end result is going to be the same, what you've done is you've put in, uh, you know, put in spin echo and Clifford kind of operations in the middle of this to get you a randomized benchmarking sequence. They can be explicitly chosen to be in spin echoes. They can be randomly chosen so that you can get back to this situation. But you can transform any circuit into something that looks like a randomized benchmarking circuit. That's going to give you the same result at the end. But it just has these randomizing gates. And this is great because with these randomizing gates, then you're decorrelating all your errors, and then uh, uh, you're not going to get this horrible uh, dependence of T squared that you would get, for example, with a coherent dephasing error. And then the errors will be behave better and, and, and add incoherently. That's the idea. Yes? So this is more useful when you have when coherent errors are dominating. Right. Like right. Right. If, if, if incoherence errors are dominating, then all of the, the error probabilities add and everything's simple and you do what you want. But experimentally, you know, you can have coherences. And this is a way to randomize all those so that they don't add coherently and make it bad. So is there a categorization of what the relative <coughs> Yeah, and it is, it's possible to kind of get, uh, uh, get coherent and incoherent. You can pull out that kind of information if you want. But the nice thing is if you have any coherent errors, you can randomize and get rid of it using the idea of randomized benchmarking. So this is actually not just some measurement technique, but it is the way to compile an algorithm into to make your, your algorithm stable in a real experimental situation. By the way, this is not known very much in the group, and I have to do a better job explaining that for my next summer school, but it's really important. This is how we're going to build. If we don't have this trick, we probably can't build a quantum computer. This, we really need to use this trick. But it's nothing but spin echo. The, the concepts of spin echo, once you understand that, you're just uh, formalizing that in a nice way. Yes? Um, in, in the end, you have to be able to uh, take a gate and commute it through a known operation. So you know that for Clifford gates. I imagine for other gates, you might be able to do that too. So yeah, it, it might work for non-Clifford gates. I haven't thought about it. Clearly, you know that works for Cliffords. And Cliffords are usually good enough to, random, you know, to, to do randomized benchmarking. So that, you know, that, but, but maybe it, it, it could be better. OK, thank you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll add some slides here next time, because this is a really good point. OK. so. You can measure, uh, you can measure the, the qubit fidelities. You can do two qubits at the same time and both get randomized benchmarking sequences and see what happens to that if there's any crosstalk. And we've shown that there's little crosstalk, but you can characterize that very well. I'm not going to show that. I'm going to talk next about a leakage to the second excited state as something we have to worry about. Okay, so well, we've been talking about uh, using the zero and one state. The two state energy is a little bit lower. 
And what we say is that because that's a little bit lower transition energy from here to here, when you drive this transition, this is off resonance, and we're not going to excite it. Uh, that's true if it's a really, really long pulse, but we want to make the pulses as short as possible. So how do you get the physics uh, of working that? So basically what happens is we take some microwave pulse here like this, okay? So the pulse amplitude, uh, it's a microwave pulse, so it's going to pulse going up and then going back down again. And I'm plotting the waveform envelope here. And the, a waveform envelope that we like to use is a, a chopped off cosine uh, pulse here. Okay, but uh, the details don't matter really too much. And what happens is when you have this kind of uh, envelope to the pulse, to the microwave pulse, you can Fourier transform that to get the frequency, uh, the, the power in spectrum. And of course, this is centered around the transition between zero and one. But at the frequency between one or two, which is a little bit lower than this by 200 megahertz, there could see, be some power in this spectrum, and that power is going to drive that transition. It's going to drive the one to two transition, and you're going to get some uh, driving between, uh, between these two. Okay? So that's kind of a problem, and that's what you have to do. And that's why you use long pulses. If it gets longer and longer, then this gets narrower and narrower, and then there's less and less power driving it in the wrong sense. Okay? Yes? Yeah. But if you take pulses that are very, that go like from zero to one very quickly, what happens? Yeah, so if you, if you do a, uh, a square wave pulse, and then you Fourier transform that, you get a sink. Okay. And you have a pretty long lobe, uh, lobe structure here. Now you're going to say, hey, oh, let me make sure that that uh, zero is right at the one, two tra transition. And then what happens is my really dirt simple model here just doesn't work anymore. It's qualitative. And you have to do the, the, the computation and figure out what's going what's to happen. So um, in fact, you know, what you really want to do is you want to choose something that's minimum in time and minimum in frequency at the same time. And that's basically a Gaussian. Uh, but if you want to do a finite time pulse in time, it's something called a Slepian, and you can play around with all those pulses and do everything. But it turns out there's kind of a simpler and better trick to do this that works well. Okay? And one is to use this cosine shaped pulse, which I'm talking about here. And second is to use a very simple idea to zero the amplitude at omega 1, 2, which is here. But to start with a kind of a Gaussian looking pulse in the beginning, so the lobe, the side lobes are small anyway. And this is kind of a, a, a neat trick, is the amplitude we're going to do is going to be this x of t. And again, this is this kind of chopped off cosine kind of function. But we're going to add to it the derivative of x uh, 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 to that in, in quadrature in the, in the opposite phase. And then we're going to the, adjust the amplitude of this. And this amplitude actually is normalized to the nonlinearity here. Okay? So here's, uh, here's our, our uh, in phase, and here's our quadrature i component here. So a derivative of cosine is a sine wave. And we can either have a coefficient alpha of a half or a coefficient alpha 1. Okay, now how does that work? If you Fourier transform this, okay, you're going to get a Fourier transform of the x, okay, which is going to transform into some shape like this. But the Fourier transform of this part of here is going to give you a 1 plus alpha omega minus omega 0 uh, normalized by eta. And if omega minus omega 0 is eta, which is the definition between the 1, 2, and 0, 1, 
this number goes to zero, and uh, if you choose alpha equal one, then this whole quantity here is, is zero. So by putting in this quadrature derivative part of the signal, we can zero out the spectrum at a particular frequency. Okay? That's the rough idea of what's going on here. We start with something that has a pretty good uh, shape, uh, small shape in time and small shape in frequency, and then we add in a quadrature component to zero the spectrum at the wrong frequency and then see if we can get it to work better. And of course, we, we have to tune in this number. This is a little bit uh, semi-quantitated, so we tune in the number. So what we do here is data. This is taken randomized benchmarking, leakage rate, but this is actually measuring the probability to get into the two state at the end. You know, it should be in zero and one, but we're measuring n in the two state. When we just put in this raw pulse by itself, alpha equals zero, that's the green data right here. And what we see is as is the pulse length is very short, then the probability to make a two-state transition is pretty high, and that's bad. Okay, that's what happens. And, you know, with a, uh, a, a 200 megahertz nonlinearity, 1 over 200 megahertz is 5 nanoseconds, and if we just double that to 10 nanoseconds, then you see it's pretty bad. So you can roughly estimate how long your pulses have to be. But if you make it longer and longer, then this gets tighter and tighter, and then uh, the error uh, goes down here almost in the part per million, uh, five part per million range, very, very tiny, okay? And then if you wait too long, then you're just going to get thermal transitions, and this goes up a little bit. You then put in this derivative here and zero out the spectrum right here, and you tune it, in this case, to the 1.1 parameter. That gives you the best result. And now either at this range, instead of being 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3, it's below 10 to minus 4. And then if you're at, uh, what is it, uh, 10, uh, 12, 14 nanoseconds, then you're in the part per million range for the errors. So you can, you can fix this up, drop this down by order of magnitude or more by tuning in your pulses properly. Yes. Um, you can. You still have to be able. You still have to calibrate to do a pi pulse, uh, or you you have to make sure that your zero to one transitions okay. And there are some constraints due to that. So uh, yeah, one can play around with this a lot. We found that you know this kind of simple procedure, you know, works pretty well. You know, when you, when you get all the global optimization, you, you do a lot of things to get this to work. Yes? How is what? Yeah, so what we do is we do um, uh, the, the randomized benchmarking, and then in, instead of measuring like the zero or one state at the end, we measure the two state. That's the probability of being in the two state. And then we divide by the number of Clifford gates to get that leakage. And you have, there's data to show that that's a reasonable approximation. So it's great. You know, we can really, you know, uh, this part per million errors due to that, uh, that thing. It's not zero. It's still there, but you can tune everything up and get it to work right. Yes? So, uh, um, you know, uh, okay, we're 10 to minus, you know, the 10 to minus 5, we do 100 or 1,000 operations, that's 10 to minus 2, we don't have to worry about it. Eventually, when we're going to want to do error correction, we're going to have to worry about this, and, uh, okay, eventually, we'll, we'll work there. But we think this is, this is really low enough in the foreseeable future, we don't have to worry about it. And it's not too hard to measure, but eventually, we'll have to worry about it. And we'll have to do error correction. It's only so far you can go here. Can you remind me the lengths of the pulses for one and two cubic gates? So, uh, 12, 10, uh, this is 10. So that's uh, 14, maybe up to 20, depends on how safe we want to be. So, you know, you have 200 megahertz, one over 200 megahertz is five, and you're at maybe three times that length, and then you're okay. 
and then you're safe. So, mostly you have to measure it to make sure you're not making a mistake. Okay, good. So we've dealt with that. Now we're going to talk about two cubic gates. Okay, and um, uh, the first thing we're going to do is you know we'll talk about what we're doing. There's a very long history in quantum information that sh to do multiple qubit gates, you absolutely need a, a qubit bus. Okay, and and it's true for ions. You ab you, you know you absolutely need to to couple them to a, to a bus to get them to couple, to couple together. I think spin qubits. They're, they're really looking at a bus for, for, for doing things, but we're, we tried making a bus. So here's a, here's a qubit. It's capacitively coupled to this resonator, capacitively coupled to another thing. And we got it to work, uh, you know, with, a, I don't know, a few percent errors. But we kind of didn't like it because the bus meant that way we were doing things are a little bit slow. Also, if there is a f stray photon population in the bus, then the coupling between here and here has an error in it. It basically is nice. You can separate the qubits, but it makes the whole operation for a two qubit gate more complicated. There's more moving parts. There are more things that can go wrong. So it might be a good idea for other people. We're very interested to see what people can do. But to make things simple, for, to get good fidelity, we just directly coupled the qubits together, which we can do because our qubits are so big, right? Because they're large, this is hundreds of microns across, it's very easy to build some uh, and, and do direct coupling, okay? And uh, we, to get this to work properly, you have to really tune in your parameters right. Uh, in a way that I'll have to describe. So it's the simplest thing imaginable, two qubits, just capacitor coupling from this qubit to this qubit. And then what we're going to do is to turn the interaction on, will being the two qubits on resonance, same frequency or near the same frequency, and to turn it off, we're just going to detune them. Okay, very simple, uh, simple way to doing it. That is, it. It's tricky, you have to do it right, but you know, that's what we're, we're starting with here. Okay, so you have qubit coupling from nearest neighbor capacitance, simplicity for good uh, performance. Here are the qubits on the line with coupling. Here are the lines coming in to control both the qubit frequency and also to drive the qubits. There are resonators on top here to read out the qubits and I'll describe how that works later. And then we have the readout uh, bus here. So this was the, the, the chip we made to get this to, to work here. So, yes? So in the figure, it seemed like resonator and the size, size is different frequency Yeah, the resonator length is a little bit different so that they can be frequency multiplexed. I'll, I'll get to that. Slightly different frequency length of all those different resonators. So different, I, I'll get to measurement, I'll get to all that. Okay, good question. I first want to talk about coupling of qubits. Nice thing about here is we can go back to the linear circuit and understand qualitatively what's going on. In fact, it's fairly quantitative also what's going on. We're just going to take two LC resonators, have a capacitive coupling. There's nothing but coupled modes. You've all studied this before. You have the equations of motion. You just sum up, you say the, the current sum of each of the nodes is zero. You can then write this in matrix form. If there's a voltage across each of these, uh, you, uh, you uh, can write, uh, write the matrix in this way, where you're coupling between the modes V1 and V2 with this coupling capacitance. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to linearize this uh, to be a, uh, 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 here's, the, here's how you linearize it uh, in here. Let's not go into that. You can linearize this response. So it's some constant omega one minus omega, where omega one is the oscillation frequency of this qubit, and omega two is the oscillation frequency of this qubit. And then you solve for your normal modes, which is the difference in, in frequency within the, the 
uncoupled frequencies omega 1, omega 2, minus this coupling coefficient is equal to zero. And you solve for frequency. I mean, you, you've done this. And you know, uh, you know uh, that what will happen is this is equal to zero when omega is a little bit li different than omega 1 or omega 2. And you'll get a, a coupling of the modes. So it's just a, a coupled oscillator physics. OK? That's the classical way to do it. Quantum way to do it. We're going to solve for weak coupling, Schrodinger equation. I'm going to write down the coupling Hamiltonian. OK? If CC is 0, then the coupling Hamiltonian is 0. So it's proportional to CC. And it's going to be a V1, V2. So it's CV squared for the coupling. And you can solve that uh, with circuit theory. But uh, you can just write it down, too. That's correct. And like we did before, these hat operations are Q over C. And just like with the bias case, you can go ahead and work this out. These are A minus A daggers. And they C1 and C2s come over here. Here's are the frequencies. Uh, and then when you look at these terms, you're going to look at energy conserving terms that are A and A daggers. The A, A terms are going to change the frequency by 2 times 6 gigahertz or 12 gigahertz. Those are going to be off resonant terms. You don't care about that. And you're going to get a A1, A2 dagger, A1 dagger, A2. This is excitation swapping. This will swap, for example, a 0, 1 state to 1, 0 state. So you're taking the energy in one mode and swapping it over the other mode. And of course, with the complex conjugate, it can swap back. And then you have a coupling constant that is typically written as G. OK. And so you can write down the Schrodinger equation, h bar, the difference in frequency. You just uh, diagonalize this with the coupling between the 0, 1, and the 1, 0 states. These are the only states that are affected. And then you solve for the eigenfrequencies this way. And if you know, look at this formula right here. And if you can check me, this G defined this way, this is the exact same formula we had right here. OK. So this swapping physics quantum mechanically happens at the same frequency as what you expect classically. And you're just swapping at single excita photon excitation between one qubit at the other. Questions on that? Yes? In this scheme, the coupling will always be on, right? Yes, we have, uh, we have a fixed capacitive coupling. It's always on. So this number G is constant. Yeah. OK. So you solve for omega. And this is the case of uh, uh, where we have uh, uh, omega 1 and omega 2, uh, where uh, omega 1 uh, is differing from, here's a plot of the avoided level crossings. OK, this is a difference of omega 1 and omega 2. When omega 1 and omega 2 are different, you get basically the frequencies of omega 1 and omega 2. Uh, and then when you have them equal, you get a splitting of the modes by 2G in the normal way. These eigenstates are basically 1, 0, and 0, 1. And these eigenstates are uh, uh, 0, 1 plus 1, 0, and 0, 1 minus 1, 0, the symmetric and asymptomatic states. OK, so this is all what you know. And basically, you think of this as when it's on resonance, the effective coupling is on. And you can transfer the states back and forth to make your gate. And when it's off resonance, the, the coupling is off. Not perfectly off, but I'll show that it's off well enough to be useful. OK? And you can do an experiment, for example, where you start in the 0, 1 state. And then you turn on the coupling, put it on resonance, and then that state 0, 1 will resonate to 1, 0 and back to 0, 1. And this is actually some real data uh, looking at the probability of one of those qubits oscillating in time, where you started in that qubit and went to the other qubit, came back to the qubit. So you see the oscillation in time. 
And then it shows you that if you change omega-1 minus omega-2, you get this chevron pattern, which we saw previously for the, the single qubit, uh, having to do with what happens with off-resonant coupling. But they basically, you want to be on resonance to get the full swapping there. So this is how you can tune up the gates. You can measure G from that swapping period. Okay? Good. So let's explain how um, the, the gate is made. Uh, the, the control Z gate. Uh, uh, this was shown by the, the Yale group. We did it with two qubit gates, theoretically shown by Strzok. Um, we are going to get the avoided level crossing of the 0, 1, and 1, 0 when one of your qubits is detuned to have the same frequency as the other qubit here. So this is one of the qubits detuning. And this is when the two qubits have the same frequency, you get some avoided level crossing in the energies. But what happens is before that, at this point right here, you're actually going to get an avoided level crossing between the 1, 1 state and the 0, 2 state. Okay? So one, Q, one photon, one excitation in each of the qubits, and that's going to swap to two excitations and the other qubit. And it turns out we're going to use the two qubit uh, to make the gate. And I'll show you why. It's, it's more efficient, a nice way to do that. And what's going to happen is we're going to bring these two qubits way off a of resonance so they aren't talking, and then bring it close to this resonance right here. And when you bring it close to that resonance, so here it is versus time, it's way off resonance here, and then for a certain amount of time, we'll bring it close to this resonance. And when we bring that close to that resonance, when you're in the 1-1 one, one state, because of the av avoided level, the, the re state repulsion here, the eigenfrequency will be a little bit different than if there were no interaction there. And that change in eigenfrequency will give you a change in phase. And that change in, in frequency times time here will give you a change in phase so that the 1-1 one, one state has an extra change in phase uh, uh, than if, if, uh, if you didn't have uh, it in the one, one state, the other states here. Okay? So only for the one, one state will you get this, see this other state level, re level repulsion and see the extra state. And when you uh, work this out, what will happen is all the other states, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, where you're not seeing this, this extra state, nothing effectively happens, and then you'll get, pick up an extra phase when the 1-1 one, one state, and if you adjust the timing of this properly, you can make this a minus one factor, and you can create what's called a control Z gate. Okay. Excuse me? Um, uh, there's... Uh, uh, let me make sure I answer your, your question better. Why doesn't it also change into zero two? Okay, so what happens is, is you do this, it could oscillate from one one to zero two, but you do it slow enough so that it sees the frequency only adiabatically, and the net result of coming near resonance and coming out, this is slow enough to be adiabatic, or effectively adiabatic. So you virtually uh, occupy the 0-2 state, but then you depopulate it when you come out so that the probability of being in 0-2 at the end is very small. Okay. And there's actually a, a theory that we developed on actually shaping this very precisely so that it's, a, it's, it's still adiabatic so that the error uh, is 10 to minus 5 to be in the 0-2 state. But it can be done fairly quickly of order uh, of T gate times the coupling constant is of order one. So it can be made pretty fast. I mean, clearly, if it's very long, you're going to be adiabatic. But you can get very small errors, even if that gate time is pretty short. Okay. Now, if you were to switch this very rapidly, 
okay, then you would populate the zero two state and be hard to come out of that. But you're doing it adiabatically. Okay, and this is you know that's a long talk in itself how it, how that works, but we have a paper on that. Okay, yes. Okay, so this is some calibration data. I'll show you the fidelity of this. Uh, this is old data, and it's just showing the calibration. This is the experiment you do. Is basically you do a Ramsey fringe on Q2, where you, you do a 90-degree rotation and put it on the equator so you're sensitive to phase, and then you, you measure the phase afterwards by uh, rotating it again in 90 degrees at different angles uh, in, on, the, on the control axis. And when you have no X, you see a Ramsey fringe with good visibility at, uh, at these two angles here and here. Okay? Then what we do is we turn on uh, an X. So instead of a zero going in here with no controlled phase, you have a one with this controlled phase. And then with the one, which is the X, you see this, this curve right here. And this just shifted by pi. So this just shows that the control phase gate has worked. With zero in Q1, you get uh, this particular phase behavior. With a one here, you get this particular phase behavior. And that calibrates you to pi. This is old data, so it doesn't look uh, quite as beautiful as it should. But it shows you that it's working. OK? But then we want to know how well it's working. OK? That's the next thing. So again, here's the truth table. Oh, by the way, I'm, I, we're making a control uh, phase gate here. Everyone always talks about C naughts. So is this a problem to make a control phase instead of a C naught? Everyone should. I hope everyone has learned and know by now. You can transform a CZ gate. Um, a CZ gate into a C naught by just putting some Hadamards uh, in, the, in the single qubits. So these are called an equivalence class that they're more or less doing the same thing. CZ and C naught are doing the same thing. You just have to put in some single qubit gates to convert them. So it's just as good to make CZs as it is to make C naughts. Okay. So to test this, we just do the randomized benchmarking in the very similar way that we did before. These are the waveforms for the CZ gates. Interleave between the CZ gates, we have single qubit gates to do all the Clifford randomizations. And then basically by uh, doing the straight CZ and interleave CZ, we're able to get a uh, uh, fidelity of about 99.5%. And uh, for in five qubit device, uh, between 90, 99% to 99.5% through the randomized benchmarking. But the same idea as, as before. OK. Yes? So when you characterize two qubit gates with randomized benchmarking, so is it sufficient to only apply single qubit clippers as the randomized benchmarking? Yes. You, you actually, to do it properly, you have to make a set of gates from the CZs. So you have to do multiple CZ gates to make a I swap and swap gates and do other things. So you're, you're building up the CZs as well as the, the single qubits to do properly. I think that's kind of overkill, in my opinion, on testing the gates. But that's what you want to do to do it properly. But it's a, it's a generalization of, of, of those, those ideas. Okay. Now, we make a gate, and everyone says, great, that's whatever. What you generally don't hear people talking about is what happens to your system, to your gates, when it's turned off. Okay? And especially in these systems where, you know, like you have a fixed capacitor, coupling between them, and I said we detune them to uh, 
uh, uh, get them to turn off. It's not off completely. Okay. So just as important, this is not talked about all the time, but you really have to know, okay, it's working when it's on, but also what's going on when it's off. Okay, and you have to measure what's going on with it's off. So this is a plot of what is that effective coupling rate, the ZZ coupling rate, connecting to the two state uh, versus detuning. Okay, and what we did is we had very little detuning about 0.2, and we had a ZZ coupling rate of 15 or 20 megahertz, and that allowed us to make this phase gate. Okay. But then what happens is you want to detune this far away, and then, uh, and then that, that ZZ interaction rate goes down because the voided level crossings get smaller and smaller, as you expect for detuning. And what we see is by detuning it by about a gigahertz, we can measure sigma ZZ, and the residual coupling will go down by about two orders of magnitude. Okay, so you can turn it off. You can't turn it off to zero yet. Okay, but you can turn it off uh, to, a, to a good big degree. And you need to know what this number is. Now, what happens is by the time you get down to 100 or 200 kilohertz uh, uh, detuning, I'm going to show you that that's small enough uh, interaction that if you run your algorithm properly, uh, that has essentially zero error on your uh, very small error, essentially zero error. You can ignore that. Okay, and the way you can kind of see that doing that is you just do small, ran you just do randomized benchmarking, let's say on a single qubit gate. When it's coupled to a second qubit in this place where you would have the ZZ interaction, and you see what is the error uh, versus this idle length. Okay, and what happens is, is when you have a single qubit uh, getting measured by the randomized benchmarking, that qubit is going to couple to the other qubit, and you're going to get uh, a frequency shift from that, the ZZ interaction, and you're going to get a phase change, that's frequency shift times time, and an error that's going to go frequency shift squared time, time squared. Okay, so you're going to see an error that goes as time squared. And in fact, this is what we do. We have a a, uh, a single qubit and we put idles in between doing all the Cliffords and then uh, what happens is at small idle lengths there's very little error this is at the below the 10 to minus 3 error right this is 10 to minus 4 error and then as the idle length gets bigger and bigger then we start seeing an error in the randomized benchmarking that's going up as t squared which is due to this frequency coupling to the uh, second qubit and uh, uh, the, this T square factor. So it's, qu it's quadratic fit, and it basically goes as this sigma ZZ times T gate squared, as I said, as it should go, uh, go for here. So basically, it says if you want 10 to the minus 3 error due to this kind of physics here, you have to have your gate, uh, your idle lengths less than about 50 nanoseconds, which is what we do. We, we have these so the gates are getting randomized by the uh, 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 Clifford gates of the randomized benchmarking often enough so the gate errors will be small. Okay. You can use spin echo to make this even a little bit better. Interleaving echo gates with no echo gates, you see this T squared behavior, and you interleave echoing gates to cancel out whatever that residual ZZ interaction is. It goes linearly, as you expect from decoherence errors. Okay. Questions on that? So that's how you get rid of these, uh, the, you know, the, these residual couplings. You spin echo them away. Yes. What happens is this shift depends on whether the qubit is in the zero or one state. And you, of course, don't know that in an arbitrary algorithm. So you, uh, you, you have to get rid of it with a spin echo. Uh, 
Um, what is happening here? It's 40, 30. I think what's happening here is um, these echo pulses, you're starting to pile up the control Zs, and then they're getting some interaction, and the gates start, stop working properly. So, but yeah, okay. I believe, it's been a long time, but I believe that's what's happening. Okay, so my time is up, so that's a good place to stop here, where we've talked about how the single qubits and two qubit operations work. What we're gonna do next is talk about how measurement works and then get on to some more experimental results. Okay, thank you. Yeah, right. Uh, how is the single qubit error for current state of art? I think it's gotten better by, um, uh, you know, I think the best is 99.97 or 8 now. has gotten a little bit better. Um, but um, what we're working on now is getting kind of all the qubits consistently better and also scaling it up. So we've been you're not working so hard on that number just by getting everything to work. But at at this point, we're pretty much limited by T1 and T2 effects, so uh, we kind of need to work on that a little bit more to, to get. T1 effect is from? Uh, it's the T to two level states. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to have time to get to that in, in this thing. Okay. I had a question about your CZ gates and why yes. you guys choose to do this sort of fast adiabatic thing. Yeah. Because it seems to me you could also, rather than crewing a dynamical phase that way, you could also just swap one one to zero two. Yes, you can be. Yes, you can. Uh, you can do a swap zero one to zero two and then bring it back. Right. So and and in the, yes, it, the, you can you can do it that way. Are there uh, advantages to one relative to the other? Um, the nice thing when you do it adiabatically, it, you you kind of first order insensitive to your parameters, okay. so it tends to be a little bit more stable. Uh, and then if you do it the other way, you maybe get a factor of two better, eh, not quite, but then you're ve you have to really tune that up carefully not to get two errors. So we, we kind of like this fast adiabatic because it's just more stable. I mean, if you want to just build one gate, you can tune it up to your heart content, but when you're building lots of gates and things drift a little bit over time and whatever, it's best to kind of make it, uh, make it less sensitive to parameters. Okay. So that's kind of why we do it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, is it about the way to use spin echo and uh, this randomized way to uh, compile your gates? Like, do you have a good reference to describe this? For the spin echo? Uh, 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 we have not written on that yet. Uh, so yeah, that's the, I don't think that's really out there in a good, in a good that's something we want to eventually talk about when we you know present the next generation of gates uh, and yeah I didn't actually I, I, I have to do a better job explaining this and uh, yeah we haven't written the paper yet so uh, I, I think some people kind of know that everyone knows that if you spin echo these things are gonna go away the really new idea is if you can basically randomly choose Clifford's and that's almost as effective as doing a you know pure spin echo so, uh, you know, that's, uh, I, I, I don't have a reference for that. That's something internally we've done and, um, you know, people kind of know about this. Yeah, I think people in the know know about it and it's kind of like, oh, it's trivial. And then a lot of people don't know about it and then it's more mysterious. No. Sorry.